Welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Last week we had Thursday morning, Thursday evening, Friday morning, three defining messages that are going to define really where we're going in these coming months. So everybody needs to listen to them. Those of you who were in Israel, those of you who were at a wedding, must listen to them really, because otherwise uh, a lot of, even of what I say this morning is, is um, not going to make complete sense because we've, we all need to be in the same place. And um, it's just the way things worked out, the way thing that uh, God did things last week, that those messages really do need uh, all of us to um, not only hear but take note of, live in the good of. Because that's what these coming months are going to be about. So this is sort of the fourth message in the series this morning. So let's uh, go to Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to use some very, very well-known scriptures this morning, but I want us to get a new uh, revelation through them. Verse 26, For all of you are made sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Say, all of us. So this applies to every single one of us here because we're all believers. So we are made sons of God. How? Through faith. Now what God was saying to us last week is that the key to these coming weeks is going to be faith. Everything is going to focus around faith. To believe we are who God says we are, that we can do what he says we can do that we can relate to him and to others in the way that he says, and so on. It is a matter of faith. Then Paul says, all those who have been baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. In him there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free man, neither male nor female, for all of you in Christ Jesus are made one with God. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs of all that is promised. Then if you go down to verse 6 of chapter 4, And once you became his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, enabling you to call him Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but now a son. And because you are a son, you are one of God's heirs. Right, now the first thing that we need to understand is that there is a threefold process that has taken place in our lives. We talked on Friday morning about the life being in the blood. Now, the blood has enabled us to become sons. Without the blood, we could not be sons. So the first verb that we've got to focus on there is the verb enable that the blood has enabled us to become sons. The blood does not make us sons, but the blood enables us to be sons. Without the blood, we could not be the sons of God. Then, we have been adopted as sons through faith. So, just as that blood was necessary to enable us, so faith is necessary to become. So that's the the next verb. We've been enabled, we have been able to become the sons of God through faith. So we need the blood and we need faith. Uh, But then God has made us his sons through faith, so that we become heirs with Christ. And that is because he has 
poured his Holy Spirit into our lives. So he chooses to adopt us and the Holy Spirit enables us to become the sons of God. So there's this threefold process. The blood, the faith that enables the adoption, and then the Holy Spirit that makes us sons. And if we're sons, then we're therefore heirs. Now all this was the plan and the purpose of God. This whole process. But what we need to explore this morning is what it means to live as a son. So I want you to go to Luke chapter 15, the parable of the father and the two sons. Now, we're not going to talk about the worldliness and the restoration and all of that, but we're going to look at the relationship between the father and these two sons because this parable has a lot to teach us about the relationships, which is why it's a tragedy that it's being called the parable of the prodigal son, because that's not really what it's about. Then Jesus said, verse 11, there was a father who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, please give me the share of the inheritance that is due to me. So he divided the property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered his possessions together and left for a distant country where he wasted his inheritance by indulging himself with an immoral lifestyle. But a severe famine struck that land when he was broke, leaving him destitute. In desperation, he found a job locally with a farmer who sent him into the fields to feed his pigs. The son longed to eat the pig's will, but no one gave him anything. This brought him to his senses, and he thought, How many of my father's servants have more than enough to eat, but I am starving with hunger? I will return to my father and will say to him, Father, I sinned before heaven and you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired servants. So he set out for home. His father saw him in the distance and filled with compassion for him, ran to welcome him with a big hug and a kiss. The son said, Father, I have sinned against God and you, and I am no longer worthy to be your son. But the father immediately said to his servants, Go quickly and fetch the finest robe and put it on him. Bring a ring for his finger and shoes for his feet, Then kill the fattened calf so we can celebrate, because this son of mine was dead and now he is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. So they began the celebration party. Meanwhile, the oldest son returned home from the fields. As he approached the house, he heard the sound of the music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked what was happening. The servant replied, Your brother has returned home. And your father has killed the fattened calf in celebration because he has received him back safely. But the older son was angry and refused to join the feast. So the father went to persuade him to join the celebration. But he answered his father, Look, for years I have served you faithfully and have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a goat for a feast with my friends. But now this son of yours who has wasted your money with prostitutes comes home and you kill the fattened calf for him. The father replied, My son, you are always with me, and everything that is mine is yours. Come and rejoice, because this is your brother who was dead, but has now come to life. He was lost, but now is found. Now, if God has adopted us as sons, he is our father. So we're to relate to him as father. Jesus actually said, When you pray, say, Father. Jesus' purpose is that we pray to God as our Father. And the Holy Spirit enables us to cry, Abba, Father. We tend to pray more to Jesus and Father. And in one sense, it doesn't matter because, you know, the Father and I are one, Jesus said. But God wants us to address him as Father because it keeps us in constant reminder of our sonship. And he wants us to live as the sons of God. So Paul says the Holy Spirit enables us to cry, Abba, Father, Father, Father. The Holy Spirit, if we pray in the Spirit, the Spirit is going to encourage us to cry out to God as Abba, as Father. 
Abba is, is not daddy. I mean, it is the word that a little child would use, but it, it is not used in, in Hebrew, in the biblical context, in the same way as we say dad or daddy. Because it, there is a profound respect in this word, which is often missing in, in uh, relationships today. So when Jesus talked about his father, and if anybody could call him dad, it would be Jesus, but he always says holy father, righteous father, heavenly father, profound respect for his father. And that's how we should think of him. Yes, father, yes, intimate with him, but profound respect all the time. He is the holy father, he is the heavenly father, uh, he is the righteous father. Now, let's examine these relationships in this um, uh, parable. We must bear in mind this process, that we are enabled to be sons because of the blood. We are adopted to be sons through our faith. So there has to be the repentance that lays hold of the blood, the faith that enables the adoption. And then we're made sons by the Holy Spirit's activity and... That means when we're born again of the Spirit. And then, of course, we become heirs with Christ of everything that God has. So that, that is, if you like, the foundation of our sonship. Right, now what happens in this parable? There's the Father, clearly in this parable, representing God as Father. And there's two sons. Now, both sons have inheritance. And this is not talking about a future eternal inheritance because the younger son asks for his inheritance now. Now what you see in that son is the operation of faith. He comes to the father expecting the father to give him his share of the inheritance. That's faith. Uh, it was almost a, a demand, give me my share of the inheritance. I am claiming this inheritance now. So there is a faith in, in the whole of his attitude, his thinking, his mindset as he approaches the father. He does not anticipate that the father will refuse him. He expects to receive the inheritance that he's asking for. So this younger son has a faith that the older brother does not have. Because the older brother has never come to the father expecting anything. He hasn't even asked for a goat, so he hasn't even got a goat. I mean, if the father was willing to give the younger son his whole inheritance, he would surely have given the older son a goat if he'd asked for it. So you see the contrast here between these two sons. One is a person of faith and the other is not. And therefore, because he does not operate by faith, then uh, he, does not, he is not able to enter into his inheritance. Now, what is the difference between the two? The younger son thinks like a son, but the older one thinks like a servant. The younger one has a son mindset. I am a son, he is my father. If I ask for his inheritance, he will give it to me. Very simple. When you are part of a family, you know that you have certain privileges, rights, uh, as part of the family. Uh, if, if Clive was to come and call me, he'd ding the bell, open the door and walk in. I would not expect all of you to, to do that because you are not sons of mine in that sense. But there's a, there's a, there's a confidence of knowing where you belong, so you do that. You, you, you know that you have uh, an inheritance there, if we want to put it in that way. So the young son thought sonship, 
thought therefore in terms of inheritance and realized that he was in a position where he was able to lay hold, to lay claim to that inheritance. The older brother doesn't think of himself as a son and the whole way in which he, he approaches the father is look how I have served you diligently, faithfully all these years, yet you never gave. It's that servant mindset. Now, God wants to get us out of a servant mindset into a son mindset. So that the way we relate to him, the way we pray, our expectation are all that we shall receive whatever we ask in prayer because we are praying to Father and because we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That we have all been enabled to be sons because the life of the Son was in the blood and if we have been sprinkled with the blood then that qualifies us for sonship. It doesn't make us sons but it qualifies us for sonship. For sonship. Okay, so... The father gives the son his full inheritance. However, the father never impinges upon the free will of any of his sons. He does not force us to do his will. So now we have the tragic uh, example of this son having laid claim to his inheritance, going off and wasting it. Why? Because... He knew that as a son he could claim the, the inheritance, but he was not a submitted son in the sense that he was not submitted to the father to do the father's will with the inheritance. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, there's no point in being submitted to the will of the father if you don't lay hold of the inheritance because what God wants you to do is to do both, to lay hold of the inheritance and then to use the inheritance to fulfill his will. So the son goes off and wastes his inheritance. However, he is still a son. And he loses, if you like, his identity of sonship and ends up by being a servant. And the, the lowest kind of servant, feeding pigs, which of course are unclean uh, to the Jews. So he, he ends in the depths of depravity. He can't get any lower, but he is still a son. And then it says he comes to his senses because he remembers, I am a son. And as a son, it's crazy for me to be a servant wallowing around with these pigs, starving hungry, wishing I could eat what they were eating. Perhaps most of you have never seen pig swill. Uh, during the war, uh, I, I can remember all the, there was a communal bin and everybody had to put all their sort of vegetable peelings and cuttings and everything in this bin. Nobody was allowed to put any glass or anything like that, anything that could damage, because that was going to be turned into pig swill. So I would sometimes have to take our stuff to put it in this bin, and you open the lid and it stank. And that was only in the process of becoming pig swill. So he must have been desperate to be longing to eat what those pigs were eating. Really desperate. Why? Because he'd lost sight of his sonship. But then, then he remembers, well, I am a son. But he still does not expect to be restored by his father as a son. Take me on as one of your hired servants. I've lost the privilege, I've lost the right to be regarded as a son because of the way I've wasted my inheritance. This is the way he's thinking. 
However, it's not the way the father thinks. Because as soon as the father sees him coming in the distance, he runs to meet him with a great big hug and a kiss. Why? Because this son of mine was dead and he's alive. He's lost, but he's found. He is still a son. Nothing can destroy that sonship. Now, he hasn't lived as a son for a whole period of time. He's wasted the inheritance, but he is still a son. You can have good sons, bad sons, but if you have a son, that person will always be your son no matter what he gets up to. He could end up a murderer, he could end up in prison, but he'd still be your son. So here we have this this, uh, restoration of this son, back into his privileged position. Now, he's lost ground because he's wasted his inheritance. But nevertheless, he can live again as a son. And even though that which was his by right has been wasted, the father is still full of grace. The best robe, ring, shoes for his feet, kill the fatted calf. It's all grace, 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 grace. He doesn't deserve any of it, but already the Father is lavishing gifts upon him because he is now restored as the Son. What is the Father wanting to accomplish in him? Is he just wanting to bless him? No, he wants to restore his son mindset. You see, what what he said to the father is, Father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father cuts him off. He doesn't even let him finish his pre-prepared speech. He cuts him off at that point because that is a statement of unbelief. That's a statement of denial of the truth. Because he is still a son. So he's not going to hear the bit, treat me as one of your hired servants. No, so he, he is putting him back in the place of sonship. Now we have the older one who doesn't think in terms of sonship and inheritance. I am here to serve. Now actually, of course, in the whole Jewish um, way of things, the elder son has the first right of inheritance. So he had a greater right to inheritance than the younger son, but he doesn't have that faith mindset. Are you breathing? So he is just slaving away, doing his stuff, not expecting anything from from the Father in terms of graciousness. So he is annoyed when he hears the celebration party in progress and hears what it's all about. Because to him the Father is being unjust. This young son of yours, not brother of mine, but son of yours, has has uh, wasted your inheritance with prostitutes. Here I've been faithfully serving you and you haven't given me anything. Now the father's answer to that is, well, you haven't asked for anything. My son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. If the younger son has already had his inheritance, then everything that's left belongs to the older one. So everything I have is yours. What do you mean you haven't had a goat? You never even come and ask for a goat. If you didn't expect, you, why didn't you ask for a goat? Because you didn't expect I'd give you one. You don't have a sonship mentality. The younger one did. Okay, he wasted his inheritance, but he had a sonship mentality. He lost it, needed to have it restored, but the older son didn't even have a sonship mentality. Now, what does that teach us? You can be a son and not think of yourself as a son. Now, that could be true of several people in this room. That you don't have a sonship mentality. I wouldn't, 
judge you for that because it wasn't until 1970 that I got a sonship mentality. And that is what actually was the key to the revival beginning in, in um, <coughs> Luton and everything that followed thereafter. Just that revelation that I was a son of God transformed my life and ministry, transformed that church, and the rest is history. How that impacted the nation and many other nations and so on. But it all came out of this simple revelation that I was a son of God. I was reading not actually the Galatians passage, but the Romans passage at the time. And I suddenly realized... Not that I needed to become a son, but I was a son of God. And what that did to me was I realized I need never again minister as an Anglican clergyman. I was a vicar at the time. And I need never again minister as an Anglican minister. Now... Everything I do will be done as a son of God. I will preach as a son of God. I will pray as a son of God. I will heal like a son of God. I will relate to others as a son of God. I will relate to God as a son of God. Everything I will do as a son of God. I will think as a son of God. I will speak as a son of God. I will act as a son of God. It was just a revelation that came in a moment of time. I mean, it was as quick as that. And I just realized that everything in my life from that moment was going to be done as a son. So if I was going to preach, I was going to preach like a son of God. So the next time I preached, I preached like a son of God. My first sermon, because this happened just uh, as I was preparing to take up the responsibility of being vicar of this church in Luton, the first sermon... Uh, really was my first sermon where I really preached out of the revelation of being a son of God. I can remember what I preached on too. I preached on uh, Jesus walking on the water. And I said, now I'm going to get out of the boat and walk on the water with Jesus. Is anybody going to join me? That was the essence of that first sermon. But you see, I realized I could walk on water now. I'm not talking about physically, but I could do the impossible with Jesus because I was a son of God. I was not going to be limited and tied down by the natural that everything that was going to happen in the, in the life of that church was going to be supernatural because we're sons who had the supernatural life of the supernatural father. There's nothing natural about the father. You see, we think of Jesus in terms of his natural life here on earth, although now he is the Lord of glory. But there's nothing of natural about the Father. God is spirit. Therefore, everything we do in relation to the Father will be supernatural, which is why Jesus had such a focus on the Father. I will speak only what he gives me to speak. Why? Because there will be supernatural words. I will do only what I see my Father doing. Why? Because there will be supernatural activities. So if, as, as God was talking to us last Thursday, if we're going to be like Jesus, which is his call upon our lives here and now, not in the future when we go to heaven, if we're going to be like Jesus, then we're going to be living in the supernatural. We're going to therefore need a sonship mindset so that we anticipate the supernatural every day of our lives. Whatever we're doing, when we pray, we expect supernatural uh, answers when we, when we, whatever we're doing, when we're going out and witnessing, we're expecting the supernatural. When we pray with people, it's got to be the supernatural. Why? Because it's Father in the name of Jesus. Are we getting this? So, we are sons. There is nothing more that has to be done for God to make you his son. But now it's a question of thinking as a son. Now, if you think as a son, you are not going to put yourself in the enemy's camp. You see, effectively, what the younger son did was to put himself in the enemy camp. 
what he did with his inheritance was to serve the devil instead of to serve the father. And because he was serving the devil, he lost everything. He was reduced to a starving, destitute person. Now, you see, believers can do that. He was a son of God. We're not talking about people that didn't belong to the Father. This is not a parable about unsaved people. It's a parable about saved people. Because only saved people are sons of God. But you can see people wander off. They wander away from God. They get into their own thing through pride, through self-righteousness, through whatever. And they end up feeding pigs. Now you don't see that immediately. You see, when he first left home, that son had a good time, as he rated good times. It was parties, it was money, it was women, it was everything that the flesh would want. It didn't look as if he was degenerating into uh, a starving, destitute person. But his feet were already on the slippery slope. I wonder how many times during that process he could have repented. If we put it into the context of a modern day Christian, how often, because a Christian would have the Holy Spirit, how often would the Holy Spirit have called him to repentance while he was on the slippery slope? But out of his pride, out of his self-righteousness, out of his desire to please himself, he just persisted in his way and went down further and further and further and further till he hit rock bottom. Yet still he was a son. But you see, because of his disobedience, he lost his sonship mentality. His sonship mentality was, I can go to my father and ask him for anything and he'll give it to me. But he lost any confidence to do that. This is why John says in his first epistle, that we have confidence before God and receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. You see, obedience and submission to the will of God gives you confidence before God. When you don't have confidence before God, the only way you can survive is to try to stir up a self-confidence that is of the flesh, not of the spirit. So you'll often find in disobedient Christians, I'm all right, I'm all right, there's nothing wrong, it's fine, thank you, I'm doing very well, I know, I know, yeah, the Lord is with me, yeah, yeah. It all sounds so good. But actually that person is on the slippery slope of losing all sense of sonship, of confidence before God because of disobedience, because of unbelief, because of whatever. So you can see that disobedience robs people of that sonship identity. They don't cease to be sons, but they don't identify with the fact as sons. And unbelief has the same effect because that was the older brother's problem. Now, if you've got a combination of the two, the unbelief and the disobedience, you're in a right mess, aren't you? (laughs) And there are some people like that, let me tell you. But what God wants (laughs) all the time, excuse me, is to restore us to his best. Now, the way he restored the younger son was to forgive him, to receive him back into his status as a son. The way he dealt with the older son was to get him to join the party. 
Now, uh, this is something that we've got to come to terms with, you see, because in this parable there are two parties. There's the right party which the father puts on, and there's the devil's party where the prostitutes were. Hello? Now, the younger son made the mistake of going and joining the devil's party. The older brother wouldn't join either party. He didn't know how to party. <laughs> he obviously had never been to Rafi, had he? <laughs> so, <clears throat> God wants us to know how to party. He wants us to know how to celebrate as sons. And he wants us to know the right way in which to celebrate as sons. Not to celebrate in the wrong way, but the right way. Now the wrong way feeds the flesh, the right way feeds the spirit. The wrong way is self-indulgence, the right way exalts the Lord. Glorifies him. So praise God... He wants his sons in the party. He wants us to celebrate. When we come together as the body of Christ, he wants it to be a celebration. <coughs> Amen? When uh, in the charismatic movement, when these evening sort of meetings began with people being open to the, free, to the freedom of the Spirit, they were called celebrations. Uh, and uh, that was not sort of used of meetings before, except for communion. People talk about celebrating Holy Communion. You see, we are to celebrate, aren't we? Yeah. We're celebrating the goodness of the Lord. Amen. We're celebrating the fact that as sons, we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ of all that he has to give. Yeah. Am I the only one rejoicing here? Now, where do you get the sonship mentality from? Believing what the Word says. We're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So if we believe what Christ Jesus has done for us, what Christ Jesus has made available to us, who and what we are in Christ Jesus, we will live as sons. Now, God was talking to us on Thursday about what it really means to be like Jesus, which is his call upon every one of us, which is why you need to hear that message. If we're going to live as the sons of God, we're going to live like the Son. We're not going to be like either of those two sons in the parable. We're going to be like the Son that was sent from heaven to live among us. And we're not going to be doing that out of making Jesus our example. That's the old evangelical way. Jesus is our example, and everybody's tying themselves up in knots, trying to, trying to imitate Jesus. And actually, you can't do that. You really cannot do that. Because that is striving and struggling in your own self to be like him. The only one who can be like Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in you. He is the other counselor who God has put within you. Now, the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> excuse me, the Holy Spirit wants you to enjoy your inheritance. Yes. The Holy Spirit says, Come and enter the party. <clears throat> but it's more than just a party. Because you've got to lay hold of your inheritance and use it, but not use it in the wrong way, but to use it for the glory of the Father. And to bear much fruit for the glory of the Father. So praise God. See, he said to the older son, My son, you are always with me, and everything that is mine is yours. 
Now, that's, that's the kind of mindset God wants to create it in us. Everything that is the Father's, everything that he gives to Jesus, is ours by the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus was saying uh, in, uh, at the Last Supper to the disciples, where Jesus said, All that the Father has is mine, and everything that is mine the Holy Spirit takes and makes it known to you. So everything that the Father, everything that the Son, everything that the Holy Spirit has is yours. But all that has to be made known. Now, how is it made known? And remember, to make known in the New Testament is to make known in your experience, not to make known in your head. So how does all this get made known by faith. Uh, how, how can your level of faith be assessed at this moment? Very simply, by what measure you are at this moment laying hold of your inheritance. That's your faith. Your level of faith is how far you are laying hold of your inheritance. What's the level of your obedience? How much you are using that inheritance in the way that God intends. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. The old hymn sums it all up. Faith and obedience. Faith enables you to take hold of your inheritance. Obedience enables you to use it in the right way. And we all love that word, obedience. But you see, you can't use what you haven't laid hold of. Now that's why Paul, right at the end of his life, when he's writing the epistle to the uh, Philippians says, I want to take hold of everything for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. I do not yet claim to have taken hold of all of it. The inheritance is so great that you can be a Paul who has served the Lord for 20, 30, well probably 30 years by then in a wonderfully fruitful ministry and yet he's still saying, well I haven't taken hold of all of it. But I'm forgetting what lies behind. I'm forgetting what I've already taken hold of. I'm reaching out for that which lies ahead. I'm reaching out now for everything that I have not yet laid hold of. Now who knows that that's a good mentality? And that's a good attitude to have. And that's the attitude for this turn. Now, of course, you can only lay hold of what you believe is yours. You see, if you lay hold of something that you don't believe is yours, then you could accuse yourself of stealing. But you don't steal an inheritance. Amen. As I was praying about this this morning, the Lord reminded me of something. This is something I've never divulged in public. But he he reminded me of this to teach me something. I was due to come into a major inheritance, quite a lot of money. There were two of us, there was this very wealthy lady who actually was my godmother. And I was one of the two people who come into inheritance of all this wealth. And when, uh, when I got ordained and got so involved in life, I mean, I hardly ever saw her because I lived nowhere near her and 
And one day my mother warned me, said, do you know the other person is trying to get your share of the inheritance? And is suggesting that you don't care about her because you don't go and see her regularly and so on. Point is, I couldn't. But I said to my mother, well, if that is the basis upon which I'm going to have the inheritance, I don't want the inheritance. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to just try to organize my life around so that I can come into that inheritance. Now, I never know what, what happened to it, but I've never received it. I've sometimes thought, hmm, it'd be useful for the Lord's work. So who knows, God might restore that in some way at some time. But you see, you can have an inheritance and never enter into it, never claim it. God just reminded me of that when I was praying this morning. He said, well, you had an inheritance. That Now, he wasn't saying it in a critical way. He was just reminding me, you see, how it is possible to have an inheritance that you never lay hold of because, to me, that was an inheritance with strings attached. And I couldn't organize my life around those strings. I'm not that kind of a person. I'm not going to go and visit someone just so that I can get their wealth when they die. That's not where I'm at. I'd prefer not to have the wealth than to be manipulated like that. Are you understanding what I'm saying? But it's possible to have an inheritance and not enter into it. I wonder how much that would have been. <laughs> it would have been a lot of money. A lot of money. But I'm better off without it. Because, because I've had such a rich life. And I'm sure if, if uh, you know, I'd let a wrong heart motive get into my heart at that point, the course of my life wouldn't have been what it was. Because I can remember at the time, you know, it was the Lord saying to me, well, what do you care most about? I said, well, you, Lord, not an inheritance, you. I prefer to have the inheritance that comes from above than, than a wealthy inheritance from below. Amen? So to me, it wasn't even a struggle. It wasn't a battle. I didn't have to think about it. I think, well, pff, no. I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I'm, I'm in line for what you've got coming to me, Lord, because that's going to be an internal inheritance that is far better than anything I'd ever get in the natural. Probably Clive has never heard this before. <laughs> he didn't know. This is the first time I've ever spoken about it, so he didn't even know about it. So you can get revelation coming to these meetings, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> so praise God but the important thing is that we lay hold of the inheritance that matters and we don't want to treat our inheritance from above like that say well look there is this inheritance but you know I don't know that I'm all that bothered about it well you need to be because God's purpose for your life is dependent upon you laying hold of that which he has made available to you And by not laying hold of his inheritance, then you are missing out on the purpose of God. And, and you see, why, why, why did I mention that about my inheritance? What, what's the purpose of that? Simply this, that Christians often make wrong decisions, not necessarily about inheritance, but wrong dis life decisions. For example, to get married at the wrong time to the wrong person. It can be a wrong life decision. Why? Because it's going to rob that person of the inheritance that God intended for them and instead of living up to the fullness of what God intended, they opt for something else that they wanted for themselves. Mm. I was, I was not saying marriage is wrong, or that God doesn't want people to be married, anything like that. I could say that people can make wrong 
life decisions. They can make a wrong decision to go where God is not leading them to go, but where they want to go. Of making a wrong life decision because they enter into some kind of of, uh, career where they are going to be financially rewarded, but it's not God's purpose for them. And what those wrong decisions do is to limit a person's capacity for entering into their relationship. Uh, Sorry, their inheritance. Of really being able to take hold of their inheritance. They have restricted themselves. And you could say that both the brothers in that thing made wrong life choices. Even the oldest son made a wrong life choice. I'm just going to be a servant like all the other servants. I'm not going to live as a son. I'm not going to ask my father for anything. So how important it is that we make the right life choices. And there again, those are choices of faith and they're choices of obedience, of submission to the will of God. And both those things have to operate, the faith and obedience. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Incidentally, just to put the record straight, I reckon I've probably received as gifts from the Lord far more than that earthly inheritance. I don't know how much the earthly inheritance would have been, but I reckon I've I've received far more directly from the Lord than I would ever have received that inheritance. Praise God. If you make your right life choices, then you're going to have God's best. Amen? So, where do we go from here? We walk by faith as the sons of God. We lay hold of our inheritance every day. I mean, if it's so vast that Paul was still laying hold of it at the end of his life, then we better get active every day. Say, Lord, I'm laying hold of more and more and more of that which you have for me. And you see, I believe when you, you're concerned, well, what, where, what, what life are you going to have after Rafi? I believe that depends to a great extent on how much of your inheritance you lay hold of. Because that will determine what God is able to do with you when you leave. You see, he can only do so much if people have only laid hold of a little bit of their inheritance. But the more that you lay hold of, the more he can do with you. So when God gave me that revelation, you're a son of God, and I realize right now, everything I can do, I can do as a son, that meant there was no limitation to what God could then do with my life. I didn't realize that at the time. It was only when I came to write my first book, When the Spirit Comes, that I really realized how crucial, how key that revelation was. Everything, so the first page of the first chapter is is all about that revelation of sonship, what actually happened. So you're a son of God, through faith. So how are you going to live as a son? Through faith. How are you going to Lay hold of your inheritance by faith. What are you going to do with your inheritance? That which is by faith in obedience to the will of God. Amen. Simple message this morning. All of us can understand it, so all of us can do it. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Pura la bazata paries itu di sanduma. Brota paries itu di sanduma. Hallelujah. Now thank the Lord that you're a son. The blood enabled you to become a son. The Father chose to adopt you, and by faith you became a son, and the Holy Spirit made you a son. Hallelujah. Purala bazata bakarazitaba. And the scripture says, because you're a son, you're also an heir. So thank God that you're an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ. Now thank him for the inheritance that you have as a son. Hallelujah. And tell the Lord, by faith, Lord, by faith in you, by faith in your love, in your grace, in your mercy, I'm going to lay hold of the fullness of my inheritance. Day by day, I'm going to enter more and more fully into that inheritance. I'm going to take hold of that which is mine in Christ. Hallelujah. I praise you, Jesus. I bless you, Lord. I give you all the glory. I give you all the honor. I give you all the praise. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Come on, Lord. Come on, Savior. Come on, Father. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.